if you're dyslexic, it's kind of your superpower. It's like the way that you think. Our brains, uh, they're wired to, I think, process information differently. It's just the way that you see the world. I don't think people do think the way I think. And we're curious. Uh, we're creative, I think. Uh, we can simplify things. Uh, we see the big picture. Um, and I think, uh, in the end, we connect the dots. Dyslexics tend to be very creative and very good at uh, imagining new ideas. They tend to be innovators. Uh, they tend to be entrepreneurs. The game changers in our world are that disrupt industries. Um, that provide solutions that we didn't even know that we needed or to solve problems we didn't even know we had. Steve Jobs and people like that who suddenly create new things in the world that nobody's ever seen. Einstein, the Wright brothers, uh, Winston Churchill, the list is as long as your arm of, pe of people who have had massive impact in the world, all who were dyslexic. Dyslexic minds have exactly the skills we need for the workforce of tomorrow. I think it's vital that teachers are trained about dyslexics because the world is changing and uh, and imagination is key to everything and there's going to be a lot of kids whose potential are lost unless we train our teachers to effectively teach them. This is something that's been known about for close on a hundred years and yet our system of assessing it, our system of dealing with it has not changed since the 60s. The problem we have with education today is that in order to measure children, we have to actually make them all conform to the same things. But in actual fact, what we need are children who think out of the box, who find different ways of doing things, who actually don't fit into the mould. We've got a crisis on our hands, sadly, and we need to step up uh, to address the crisis. Until we actually review the way that we're benchmarking and measuring our children, we're never truly going to be enabling dyslexic children to show what they can do. Imagine a world where you've got, you know, a little, you know, where you've got like a force of people who have this gift of dyslexia educated in a way that supports them. It means anything's possible, you know. It means anything is possible. Okie dokie. This time, hello, how are you? <laughs> it's wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful that all of you have made it here um, at the Amex Theatre at the Science Museum in London. My name is Robin Kerner. I am a CNN anchor and correspondent. I'm also made by dyslexia and I have a younger daughter who is also dyslexic. So in addition to all of you who've taken time out to come here and, and, and actively and physically uh, take part in a lot of these conversations. I also want to say welcome to the many, many people, I think thousands and thousands of people around the world who are joining us um, on the live stream. So thank you as well for taking the time. Settle down with a cup of tea or maybe a glass of wine, depending where you are. And I think hopefully you are going to just not learn a lot, but this is also a call to action and we're going to provide some very fundamental signposts and hopefully extra momentum in terms of change. So, we're at the Science Museum, as I said, and as you walk through here, I mean, first of all, an amazing space, but I don't know, all of you would have walked through here and seen these inventions as we got to the IMAX theatre, which is at the end of the hall. And so many of these world-changing inventions that literally changed the way we do business, the way we live, <laughs> were invented by dyslexics. Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, the Wright brothers, as Orlando Bloom said. Uh, Henry Ford, as well, also a dyslexic. So this is also paying homage to the dyslexic way of thinking. And our first panel is going to be about the power of imagination, because that is a lot of what we have to celebrate today. And it's not just about seeing the bigger picture. It's essentially saying the sky is not the limit. Here we go. A letter to my grandchildren. My dad, your great granddad, was an extraordinary man, full of wise words. He would often remind me that life is wonderful and it is that simple truth which has driven me as I built businesses, raised my family and embarked upon my many adventures. You are at the very start of life. It is an incredible gift and it is there for the taking. 
It will deliver highs and lows, but by living it to the full, by always trying to do the right thing, and by keeping a childlike sense of adventure, it will indeed be wonderful. I used to think of space as a destination, but I now realize it's a journey with some amazing milestones along the way. Your lives will be transformed by space and it will give your generation the planetary perspective on which the future of humanity rests. That we're all in this together, fellow travelers on Spaceship Earth. Today we pass the most significant of them all, is our beautiful VSS Unity, along with the hopes and dreams of so many, became the first spaceship built for regular passenger service to put humans into space. Virgin Galactic has shown that when you set off on challenging but important adventures, exceptional people come forward to join the journey. People who are consistently by your side and on your side. People who share your dreams and people who help make them reality. Rolling to the right. Now, before we... Before we um, move on, I do want to introduce our next Imaginers, and hopefully we're going to get Richard up on the IMAX screen very soon. We have Maggie adderin Pocock, who's a space scientist and space communicator, which is a lovely way to describe oneself. David Spear, future Virgin Galactic astronaut, he'll be joining us as well. And then, of course, Sir Richard Branson, the founder of the Virgin Group. So I want to give a warm welcome to all of them. Thank you to you all. And Richard, you are on the IMAX screen, and I know that dyslexics are supposed to see the bigger picture and different <laughs> points of view, but this is a spectacularly alternative point of view by which to see you. Um, thanks for joining us. There we go, I know. Um, talk us through, you, talk about the importance of imagination and how it's played a role in your, in your life. Oh, um, 
I mean, I think one of the wonderful things about people who are dyslexic is uh, that they do have great imaginations. They're not bogged down by boring, uh, boring facts and, and, and figures. Um, uh, they, they can let their minds wander. And um, so from a very young age, when I realized that, um, that typical schoolwork uh, you know, wasn't for me, um, I started uh, dreaming and, um, uh, and then started trying to put those dreams into reality. And, um, and I think that the fact that I was not good at certain things meant that I was very good at getting a great team of people around and delegating and um, inspiring people. And, and, it, and it seemed to work. And you, no doubt, still dreaming. I, I, of course, we're still dreaming. Um, they, no, I think it'd be sad to, for anybody to stop, <laughs> to stop dreaming. And so, you know, we, 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 about half my time is spent on uh, setting up organizations on a not-for-profit basis to tackle some of the so-called intractable problems of the world. And then the other half of my time is spent on, uh, I don't know, we've got a, our first cruise ship comes out later this year and building Virgin Hyperloop and Virgin Galactic and so on. So, um, you know, so we, 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 it's a good, a good, a good mix, yeah. Sit tight. I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. Um, yep, make yourself comfortable. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want to talk to Maggie because actually we were talking beforehand and you, you mentioned the importance of crazy dreams. Yeah. Um, in a world that, you know, so much is focused on success and doing stuff, why is dreaming and imagination so important? So I think I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I love, one of the reasons I became a scientist is because of science fiction. And science fiction shows us a, a universe of possibilities. And um, uh, uh, as a scientist, we can see those possibilities and think, well, how can we make that a reality? And so I think, um, I think one of the problems that I had as a child mm -hmm. is I, I was thinking these crazy thoughts. I was thinking you're out there, my desire. Because you're dyslexic as well. Uh, I am definitely dyslexic. And so, um, uh, and so my desire was to get out there. But uh, they kept, people would say, oh, Maggie, you know, with, with your reading and writing, you're, you're aiming too high. You know, rein your dreams in. And I think, so now I spend a lot of time going out and speaking to school kids and trying to find the sort of the, 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 the kids that are sort of disengaged with the school system and say, no, have a crazy dream. I've had a crazy dream and it's taken me to places I would have never believed. I mean, sitting here in front of you with a very large Richard Branson behind me, <laughs> I would have never believed as a child that this was possible. Yes. But because of my dream of getting out into space and that desire to get out there, it just sort of transforms your whole life. Yeah, it does. And Richard speaks about sort of people joining you in the journey of dreaming. You're very much on... On, on, on board the Branson train when it comes to intergalactic, it's not a train, the rocket ship. The rocket ship, comes to yes. in, intergalactic um, space travel. Tell us, you're, you're, a, you're a future well, astronaut. Actually. I am a future astronaut, and um, I signed on actually, um, and I think Richard possibly signed on about the same time when, when I was four years old watching Yuri Gagarin, and I turned to my father and said, Dad, what's space? He said, it's above the sky, son. There's no air up there. That's why you need a suit. And I looked at the suit on the flickery black and white television. I looked at the sky and I thought, I'm in. <laughs> That's when I signed on. And then years later when I heard that uh, Virgin Galactic was up and running, I rang this little number in London and I signed on. And that's almost 12 years ago. And I'm, I'm in, yeah. You're in. So that's hopefully, we're not going to pin you on time as I know that, uh, <laughs> Richard. Um, back to you. When we talk about dreaming and space travel, what, what is your advice for particularly kids who are, are looking at a lot of the stuff you're doing and thinking, I'm not able to pass my math test the way I would, my teachers would like it? What, what's your advice to them? Um, first of all, I think the, the system is broken. So, um, you know, I think the conventional way of judging somebody based on their exam results is, is, a, is a wrong premise. Um, so... The Virgin Group has just decided we will we will uh, not ask anybody for their exam results ever again. Um, obviously, they're going to be a pilot. Um, <laughs> well done. Yeah, love it. <laughs> yes, they like to know. But basically, for 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 um, for ninety nine percent of, uh, of situations, we will not ask for uh, ask for exam results. And um, and what we'll do is we'll interview people and we'll find out what kind of character they have and and. Um, and you know what what their dreams are, and and 
you know, a lot of Virgin's best people have never been to university, uh, left school early, and uh, joined Virgin and have cre- done, done incredible things within the company. Um, and they're very creative. So, um, as, uh, yeah, so, you know, that, that, that's something which I, I, we, we, we will try to encourage other companies to do. And I think if every company didn't ask for exam results, then schools would have to be a very different. different. Um, they wouldn't have to be just cramming facts into people, which dyslexics have problems with, uh, they, and, and, and actually a lot of people have problems with. Um, you know, they could actually think about how can we make this person a rounded person? How can we, uh, you know, bring out the best in them? Um, you know, what's unique about that particular individual? Um, um, so, uh, and, you know, so that's something we'll be working on in the years to come. Yeah, and that's also something that we'll be talking about in one of our later panels, because certain, certain businesses, certain sectors seem to be way ahead uh, compared to others. Uh, and that's also interesting and probably also good advice if the kid's looking choose a career, sometimes it might be worth looking at ones that are more open-minded about uh, diversity in thinking. Um, Maggie, to you, what can space teach us? And, and, and how, how important is it to look up there to deal with what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting um, because um, if you look back through time, every culture across the world has looked up. And they've looked up and wondered, looked up and speculated, looked up and, and desired. And so, um, so I think it is very much part of the human psyche to look up and wonder. But, and, and, but, and today, space is transforming lives in so many different ways. And, and I, I am slightly biased as a space scientist, but I think we, we take space for granted. Um, when we think of space, we usually think of, you know, sort of we think of people going into space, we think of, sort of big telescopes. But so much of, sort of the space, the satellites out there, are looking down at our own planet. It's, they're looking at climate change. Um, I, built, uh, I was working on a satellite that was sort of a, a measuring wind speeds through the Earth's atmosphere, so we can get better weather prediction, get a better understanding of climate change. There were um, uh, satellites that sort of tracking the movement of ships in, uh, sort of in Singapore. The, all these things are done by space, and they're done very effectively by space. So, we don't, um, so I, I think we take it for granted but it's very much part of our lives. And it, the future is with space as well. Um, as the human race, we're growing in population, we're sort of a, um, um, and, and the world's resources are, are sort of unlimited. Uh, um, the late, great Stephen Hawking was saying that um, we shouldn't just have all our eggs in one basket. We need to be looking out beyond um, the, the planet Earth. So we have colonies of humans across, across the solar system and beyond. And so I think it's an exciting time because um, um, I think space has started with just, uh, I think, uh, 550 people people have been out in space so far but those numbers are growing and we're sort of the things that Virgin Galactic are doing I think many more of us will get our dream coming true and I'm hoping that um, so when the Wright brothers sort of came up with their first aeroplane no one anticipated no low-cost airlines and I think this is the start of a similar journey um, so um, at the moment it's sort of quite expensive for a few people to get out into space but um, if I ask the audience here how many people if it costs the same as a first-class ticket to New York and it was as safe as air travel is today how many people here would go out into space it's a bit dark but see yes <laughs> see there's a commercial drive there and that's what's going to get us out there and that's what i find incredibly exciting at the moment and you want to be on one of those first journeys oh, absolutely i do too yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Just uh, to... i'd like to be within he's the signed up yeah, <laughs> he's on the list yeah, I've, I've got a nine yeah. 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 Uh, I, I would, uh, he's also been very patient <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you richard that's true but um it it, it is for everybody potentially and, and as Maggie was saying, really, the knowledge we're gaining in space is cascading down and it's helping us so much. Satellites were mentioned. I was born before satellites were in the sky. Now there's over 4,800 orbiting the Earth. We take for granted, as Maggie said, the wonders of satellites. Look at these things. How many of you have been on WhatsApp, YouTube, and all the various things today? And the signals are going zip, zip. And it wasn't there not so long ago. Before I was born, it was still imagination. Imagination. And Johannes Kepler, back in 1607, imagined uh, sail ships uh, in the heavens. Man might, might be brave enough one day to sail the heavens powered by the sun's waves. And he's right. Those protons, which don't have mass but have uh, inertia, are now driving little satellites the size of loaves of bread with little fans that catch the protons, and they're being positioned all around the Earth. Imagination is, is really coming. Yesterday's science faction science fiction is today's science fact. And you both speak such sense. And Richard, to you, when we talk about imagination, with that comes 
risk and hope. Mm. And is there a balancing of that or is balance the wrong word to use in any of this? No, I think there is, there is a balance. Um, the early days of aviation, um, you know, there were, there were people who lost their lives in the, in the pursuit of uh, trying to uh, get airplanes to fly. In the early, early years of space travel, in, in almost every single program, people have lost their lives uh, in, in, in the pursuit of trying to achieve something. Uh, generally, it's the very brave test pilots um, that this happens to, because there are some things you can't actually test until um, the craft is actually in the air. You can do everything you can on the ground, but until it's actually in the air, you can't test everything. Um, but you know, once you got through the through the test flights, uh, you know, then it just gets safer and safer, and and you know, hopefully, space travel, uh, you know, will, will be as safe as um, as airline travel in the not too distant future. Um, talk us through the way you think. Um, can you give us an example of, of how you visualize a lot of <laughs> a lot of this stuff? Is that can you explain to us your 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 sense of perspective and possibility? I think uh, it really is. I mean, I'm lucky enough to live on a beautiful island, and I can sit in a hammock and I can uh, dream about things. Um, and uh, and it's then trying to make those dreams um, a reality um, and, uh, and find you know, a fantastic team of people around you to help, help make it a reality. And, um, and I think you know, at Virgin, we've <laughs> set up many, many, many different ventures over, over the 50 years since I've been in business, um, almost all of them from scratch. Um, all, all started off as a dream. Um, I mean, like, you know, Virgin Atlantic started off, you know, when I got bumped from a, a plane trying to get to the Virgin Islands one day um, and decided to, you know, screw it, let's, let, let's, let's ring up Boeing and see if we can get our own plane, and, um, and, and which we ended up doing. And, and, and 35 years later, Virgin Atlantic, the team are doing, doing great. But, you know, the reason they're doing great is because they believe in, they believe in what they're trying to do. They, they love working for Virgin Atlantic. It's not like what happens with most bigger, bigger, bigger airlines. Um, and so we have a passionate, passionate group of people working together. Thank you. Uh, when we talk about how you visualize, because it's a very, you know, we're having a conversation about celebrating dyslexic strengths. From your perspective, how, how do you visualize your f engagement with space? Oh, so the, my... my my desire to get out there, it starts from before I can remember. I've always wanted to go out there. And there were a few milestones. Um, the clangers. I don't know if anyone's here familiar with the clangers. Um, well, <laughs> well, actually, a crazy dream of mine came true because they made um, a, a, an episode of the clangers this year called The Visitor, and they made a little Maggie puppet. <laughs> and I actually went to the land of the clangers, and so, so one of my crazy dreams has come true. So it, it sort of started... Never give her. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and so I think it is just sort of having these crazy ideas and thinking... Um, you have a crazy idea and think, oh, come on, don't be silly. But maybe. And it's just that maybe. And I think one of the problems is, as dyslexics, going through the school system, it is sort of the school of hard knocks. Oh, sorry, oh, don't aim high, don't think big, oh, you're dumb. We get this sort of bombardment, but I think it teaches us resilience to a certain extent. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Definitely. And we know we have, we, we're very good at finding workarounds. And so now when I come up with a crazy idea, I think, okay, that's crazy. But how crazy? You know, maybe I can, if I do this, I do that. And, and finding the problem solving. And I, so I think that's it. You come up with a crazy idea, which just passes through your mind. Sometimes I'm driving along in the car and sort of listening to the radio. and Oh, well, why can't I do that? I mean, it's crazy, but why not? And I think that is a, that why not? and the optimism to see it through as well. Yeah, I've, I've described it as, um, I also, I mean, like many of us here, had a rough time in my early school years. Went to four schools by the time I was 10. I was held back. Um, again, they either think you're too young or rather, rather stupid. And um, you land up figuring ways to get through school. Um, and I kind of call myself a bit of a street fighter. And I think this is in many ways one of the ways you're very prepared for the real world because you do come out, um, you know, with a few <laughs> black eyes and you know how to you yeah. know how to fight. I had, I had and and that. and that's also, I mean, your point exactly. Yeah, um, I, I recall as a dyslexic child having a, a rotten time of it, and um, I didn't hear the word dyslexia. I came from the dark ages, really, early sixties, and I was shoveled from one school into another. 
I actually imagined and I dreamed that Colonel Glenn was going to come along in a spaceship and take me away from these horrible situations <laughs> where I was being ridiculed yet again by this teacher and that, that sort of policy of the day uh, for some. Um, and uh, bad work was punished and, and so on and so on. Enough of that. But these things are drivers and the imagination is a saviour and the imagination and desire to do other things carries us all forward. Um, I was saying to Richard, the balance or the need between balancing risk and hope. You must be very acutely aware that there is a huge risk, potentially, of you being up there. Uh, well, yes. Um, there is much less risk, as Richard would tell you, with this uh, spaceship mechanism than any of the previous uh, ground launch systems, mm -hmm. which where once you've lit the candle, you can't stop it. Whereas ours, which drops from 50,000 feet, if there's a problem with the rocket motor, you can stop it at any time. But it still has, I should mention, some of the benefits of the uh, ground launch system in that the moment it launches, you're at three to four Gs. There's no warm-up to it. It's wham, you're there. That's fantastic. <laughs> I was going to say, that doesn't sound like a problem. Uh, Richard and I have been in the centrifuge, and uh, we've enjoyed these things, haven't we? <laughs> Have you enjoyed the centrifuge, Richard? It's so, so pleased my body body cope with it. So um, I've been yeah. two or three times since, and, and uh, it's a good good experience. I mean, I, I too uh, was um, in in the dark ages at school, um, even more darker ages than you. Um, and uh, the word dyslexia definitely didn't exist, and you know we, we were just assumed to be thick and stupid. And, Absolutely. Uh, uh, which is re re really actually why I decided to quit school at 15 because it was it, it just wasn't suited for me. Um, but um, anyway, we're, we're lucky that at least the work, at least people understand dyslexia now. Realise that yep. uh, yeah. it, it can be an advantage to kids. I mean, I, I, I hate the fact that some American parents are told that they have to give their kids drugs because they're dyslexic. Yeah. No. Dyslexic. Um, yes, <laughs> and. and <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, and, and anyway, they're, they're, fortunately, generally speaking, things have moved. Generally speaking, and I think that's also one of the reasons we're here, is that there certainly needs to be um, a rather hefty kick um, for many educators and for many people in the way they think about educating children, not just dyslexic children. Um, Richard, to you again, the issue of being a street fighter and the resilience that comes from failure um, failure when you're seven and you can't, you know, you, you can't read and, and, and constantly being lesser than some of your classmates, which all of us have felt. Yep. But in many ways, that has driven our success. How, how important is failure and, and, and being, hit, being hit down a few times? Well, I think that we, we all failed at a system <laughs> That I think was fa failed in the first place. We 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 failed to uh, learn. Um, I don't know French. I mean, no, no English person uh, can speak French, even after eight or ten years of learning it. Yet schools continue to try to teach people French for ten years. Um, and and uh, and most 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 mathematics for most people, uh, you know, as long as you can add up and subtract and multiply, that, that's that's all you need. And um, so. You know, anyway, so we, we, I think we, the dyslexics learned that conventional education was not for them, um, or, or they would get by as best they could, um, and they, they dreamt about other things, and, and, and the, the parents and the teachers who are best with dyslexic kids is to, are the ones that find out what their kids are interested in, what they love, what they're passionate about, and, and, and let them let them loose and that they could be absolutely exceptional in, in, in the areas of their passions. Yeah. Um, we're, going to be we're going to be talking about a little bit later in terms of how businesses are, are dealing with dyslexic school skills in terms of managing future jobs. Um, you said that, you know, you, you, got, you, you don't look at exam results. Are, are you actively encouraging people to put on their CV? And this is a question I'm going to ask a little bit later. I am dyslexic, I think, big picture. I am extremely good at seeing patterns and, you know what I mean? Do you think that is worth putting on a CV um, or is it, we're still not there yet? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm never quite sure whether, you know, like people who just come out of prison should have to put on the fact that they were ex-convicts um, <laughs> or, you know, dyslexic should have to put on the fact that they, you know, that they are dyslexics or, 
um, or exam results. I, I actually think it's better that um, companies make a real effort to take on ex-convicts, to take on dyslexics, to take on you know, to, uh, people generally based on their merits and what, what they can offer. In terms of a lot of what we're doing now is, is having a conversation about being out there and celebrating this. How, how do you do that in your, in your ordinary life? Well, it's funny, for, for many years, I, I'm sort of, I, I went through the system. Mm -hmm. I, I studied at Imperial College next door, mm -hmm. and I sort of came out, and I never told anyone I was dyslexic. Um, because I, I, I went and worked out in industry, and I, I still didn't tell people I was dyslexic. And I, I think it is, just as Richard said, it's finding your strengths. Yep. And, and sort of working in the space industry was fantastic, but boy, is there paperwork. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, and so, so writing reports, and, and sometimes you just get a wad of paper, and it, my heart would sink. And so, but now I've steered my career into things like communication. Yeah. Um, so empathising with people, talking to people, and telling them about my passion about everything that's out there. And so by finding where my strengths lie, I can utilise my passion for space, but I can do it in a form that works for me. And I think this is what we need to do. This is My daughter is nine and she's dyslexic too. And the thing is, when I told her she was dyslexic, because I go around and say, yeah, I'm dyslexic, she said, why? <laughs> but at the same time, sometimes she comes home and says, mummy, um, this girl says I'm dumb because I can't read as well as her. And so uh, there, are, there are so many benefits of being dyslexic, but what we need to do is sort of a, co coach our kids so that they can go through the minefield that is the education system as it stands at the moment, or even better, change the education system, but uh, so that they can come out resilient and sort of uh, ready to take on the world, knowing what their strengths are. Yeah, I mean, I, I know with, with my daughter, um, she we realised potentially she was dyslexic when instead of writing dogs, she would write bogs. <laughs> So we had, she loves bogs. Um, so, <laughs> and dogs, probably. <bother. laughs> so, you know, letter reversals are, are one, of, one, of, one of the, you know, the sort of red flags. But again, at this moment, she's be, had an amazing path of being educated at a fantastic school in America called the Skang School. And she is living her best life um, because she's, she's, she's had all the success. Um, in, in terms of how you manage being dyslexic and, and how you think it perhaps will be an asset when you go up there. Well, uh, the asset will be the imagination side. Um, I hid it, too, for years. I didn't tell anybody for a long, long time because there, there was so much shame attached to that sort of thing about being backward in the early schools. And I went through six junior schools, um, and it was purgatory. And I left school with one L-level um, at 16, uh, but found my way in other ways. So I imagined, and I, I came across something I really liked. I saw a TV program about somebody who sat behind a heart uh, bypass machine. I thought... That's what I want to do. So I walked up to the local hospital a few miles away and said, I saw this program last night. Can you give me a job as a trainee theatre technician? I'd like to have a go. And um, I ended up taking an entrance exam at St. Tommy's, and, and they laughed at my spelling and, and all the rest of it. It was rubbish. But they saw through that. They saw I had something else. And to their great credit, they took me on. And I didn't have to write copious essays. I had to know the job. I had to be practical. And when it came to exam time, thank God for me, it was multiple choice questions. You ticked the box. You either knew it or you didn't. And I did. So I passed. I, I was the youngest to qualify in the country at the time, which uh, amazed my parents, who'd uh, written me off, I think, by then, <laughs> more than once. So imagination and finding that something that suddenly there's an outlet for you. And this should be encouraged in every child. We shouldn't be beating them into a box of submission. We need to find a little channel and remind that child that now, sometime in the future, they're gonna get a little tap on the shoulder and say, hey, do you remember that dream you had some years ago? Now's the time, let's go do it. I like to call that the desire to aspire. I think everybody should have the desire to aspire. Yeah. And for me, it's sort of, yeah, getting out there. For anyone else, it could be anything, but we need to nurture them so they can reach that desire to aspire. Mm. And on that note, Richard, I'm going to give you the last word because you are Richard Branson. Um, just talk us through again as, 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 as you wave goodbye to us um, and you leave us with this conversation. Give us your final thoughts, particularly on the power of imagination again and, and, and the perspective from space, perhaps. Um, there's a wonderful book called The Overview Effect. Um, which was a book that interviewed the 500 people who'd um, been to space. Um, and every single one of those people um, uh, were altered um, 
pretty well every single one of them came back to Earth uh, trying to make the Earth a better place as a result of their trip into space. I think you know, the, the most important environmental picture of all time was the picture taken of Earth from the Moon um, many years ago, and, uh, and that beautiful blue planet. Um, and just recently, um, they have discovered another planet that looks even bluer than the Earth, um, uh, um, which, which, you know, it, it, which I wish Stephen, Stephen Hawkins had been alive to, to have seen, as, as, as um, she said earlier on, um, he, he dearly wanted us to start to colonize other planets. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, we, we, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. And uh, thanks to all the team at Made for Dyslexia for all their hard work. Um, good luck to all you parents out there who, um, and dyslexic kids. And, um, uh, and all I can say is you're, you're, lucky, you're lucky people. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> um, thanks, Richard. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy and um, it's wonderful to have your, your perspective. Um, even the, such the, a huge The backs of your heads look beautiful. Why, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. See you soon, Richard. <laughs> Cheers. Um, and, and that's that conversation for now. Thank you to both of you. I mean, it's been amazing to get your perspective. Um, Maggie, David, good luck. Thank you. Um, hopefully you're up there soon. Yeah, and I'm trying to persuade Maggie to come along. <laughs> She's not going to need a lot of persuading. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.